Good morning, everybody. Hey, we've caught a break on the weather the last couple of days. It's a great... You can almost play marbles. <laughs> yeah, you can get down. You can get down. The question is, can you get back? <laughs> I am so pleased today to introduce a person that, as we say, needs no introduction. Nonetheless, I'm going to give you one. Uh, George Drake is professor of history emeritus at the college where he's taught history uh, many, many courses in for 35 years. He's also president emeritus of the college where he served 12 years in that post. He's still teaching at the college and this semester he's teaching a tutorial on leadership in crisis. Um, maybe most significant of his many significant achievements is the fact that we're here today in this building. George was a, a member of the campaign committee for this new library and in fact the library is named in honor of George and his wife Sue to honor them for their many community contributions including Sue's service as a children's librarian and of course we're in the Calkins room Absolutely. the actual Calkins room and that's the library <laughs> uh, so uh, now the ordinary reminders. Please turn on your T-coil if you're using that. Turn off your phone if you haven't done that. And we're going to do the, the question thing kind of the way we've been doing it the last few weeks. So George will just recognize you. And um, if you'll holler out your question, George will repeat it for uh, people who didn't hear it here and for our filming public. So George, welcome. Thank you, Janet, for that uh, very, uh, what should I say, generous introduction. Can you hear me okay in the back? Yes. All right. If Tim can hear, it's, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Um, <coughs> I tore myself away from the Solomon <coughs> testimony this morning, just as he was being questioned about the July 26th call, which he's trying to be very vague about. Anyway. Uh, you folks tore yourself away too, if you happen to be watching. And th thank you for coming out. I mean, we're living through history uh, right now, and you're coming here to hear a little bit about mid early and mid 19th century history. So um, I hope I will make it worthwhile, so you won't regret having left left the hearings. Um, I'm sort of doing a series now, I guess, of called Americans We Should Know More About. And it puts me out on a limb, uh, because I'm not uh, an authority on American history. I've gotten very interested in American history in my latter years. When I was a student at Grinnell College, this, this took some real planning. I didn't take a single American history course, and I was a history major. <laughs> and we only had American and European history, essentially. Uh, my advisor was Joe Wall, American historian. And I remember we had to take comps at, at, as seniors, and I was going to be examined on American history. And uh, I sort of, you know, I said, I said, Joe, what am I going to do? And he said, why didn't you take any American history? I said, I don't know, you were my advisor. <laughs> <laughs> so I was, I was sunk into the Barnes & Noble series to, to see if I could pass the comprehensive exam. But as I say, uh, Lately, I'm doing a lot more with American history, and I'm utterly fascinated. I don't know how I could possibly have avoided the history of this really, really, I don't know if it's our own country, but it's a really, really fascinating history. So, I'm going to be talking this, this morning about Henry Clay and James K. Polk and the election of 1844, but as usual with historians, it's going to take a little while to get to the election of 1844. So don't, don't get too impatient uh, waiting for 1844. You, I hope everyone has a copy of this handout. There are some more on the chairs up in front if you don't. And uh, the portrait of Clay and the photo of Polk are pretty revealing as to the different personalities of the people. Clay was very outgoing, bon vivant, uh, drinker, 
card player, probably a womanizer, uh, whereas Pope, staunch Calvinist, doesn't he look like a staunch Calvinist, very uh, uptight, didn't talk to anybody much about his plans except for his wife. By the way, in choosing a wife, he, uh, Pope was known as Little Hickory because he was such a devotee of Andrew Jackson. And he asked Jackson to help him choose a wife. So Jackson selected the woman, Pope proposed to her, and she was such a political person, she said, I will marry you if you will run for the legislature. <laughs> so, you know, this is, this is a, they're very different, they're very different people. I'm gonna, going to begin with a sort of thumbnail sketch of each of these figures, uh, sort of basic background, and then I'm going to talk about party history. Uh, we have an interesting and somewhat complex history of party, partly because uh, the parties shift, at least the ones that have a long tenure, shift in the way that in what they represent. Uh, then I will talk about the political career of Clay in particular, and then we'll get into, and we will get into the election of 1844. So it's going to be more Clay than, than Polk. But he's more interesting than Pope, though Pope accomplished a lot. He's Pope is generally uh, considered by historians to be the president who accomplished the most in terms of what he had set out to do of any of the pre-Civil War presidents of, of the 19th century. So really a very, a very accomplished presidency. Well, with regard to Clay, born in 1777, and died in 1852. And for Gene Wubbles, he was the seventh of nine children. Gene asked me about that. Gene has a theory that middle children are compromisers, negotiators, and so on, and that was Clay for sure. He's, he's been regarded as one of the most accomplished in negotiation and compromise of any of our American political figures. Clay's father was a Baptist minister, though there's not a whole lot of evidence that uh, Clay carried on his father's beliefs and, and activities. He uh, was born in Hanover County, Virginia, and moved to Lexington, Kentucky in 1792. So his political career is associated with, with Kentucky and particularly the area of Lexington. He trained as a lawyer in Virginia with the famous jurist George Wyatt, who also uh, was part of the training for John Marshall, uh, the other American I talked about. He married Lucretia Hart in April of 1791. They had 11 children, five boys and six girls, and five of the six girls died prematurely, not as babies, but uh, in, in later life. He was a slaveholder. He had 24 slaves at his Ashland estate, which was an estate built in Lexington. And then, as I indicated, he was a a vibrant, outgoing, bon vivant uh, kind, of, kind of person. Now, Polk was somewhat younger, born in 1795, roughly almost 20 years younger, died in 1849. Uh, Don and I were just talking here about the fact that he vowed as he became president that he would serve only one term. He kept that vow, he served only one term, and then died within about four or five months of leaving the presidency. He left the presidency in March and I think died, well, less than four or five, died in June or July of that year. So if he had intended to serve, and, uh, he would have had a hard time doing that if he wasn't alive. Uh, <laughs> he was born in North Carolina uh, from, as I say, a staunch Calvinist family. When he was 11, the family moved to Middle Tennessee. And his father became a successful land speculator. And you can see at this particular period, they're just settling this area. And so someone who goes into land and land speculation might do very well. He did do very well. And there's a kind of psychological interpretation about Polk. Because as I think we know, he added a whole lot of territory to the United States of America. And he acquired a sort of feeling that wealth and prosperity is associated with getting land acquiring land. So you can sort of see it's built into him that maybe the United States will continue to do well and do even better if we could acquire more land. Um, he graduated first in his class at the University of North Carolina, so obviously a very bright guy. Became a successful lawyer 
And as I had indicated already, that he was a profound disciple of Andrew Jackson and trusted Andrew with his choice of wife. Uh, generally speaking, the quote is that people found him to be a narrow man of a, with a dull personality, not much interested in literature, nature, and society, essentially all politics and public policy. And he made, when president, very few public appearances. So he really isn't, I mean, almost opposite personality from, from Clay, who reached out, saw people, and so on, loved society, loved being around people. Uh, Pope was more or less satisfied with being his, with his wife in the White House. The White House was a pretty dull place when, I mean, it, because his wife also was a staunch Presbyterian. She banned all cards and dancing in the White House during, during, during Pope's presidency. So there is sort of a brief thumbnail sketch of these two people. And I, I thought this would be an opportunity to sort of go into party structure because Clay is associated with both the creation of the Whig Party and with the development of Whig Party policy. Who are the Whigs? I mean, Abraham Lincoln began as a Whig, uh, Whig and he worshipped Clay. So where uh, Polk was tied tightly to Jackson. Lincoln himself was tied very quite closely to Clay. So uh, Lincoln became, quote, a Republican, but how did all that happen? I want to say just a little, just a little bit about this party, stru party structure. And this is really sort of very general and, and I hope brief. The first parties, which according to George Washington should never have existed, Washington hated parties, did not like, didn't think that the United States should you know, developed as Britain had developed into a sort of party political structure, but parties inevitably have. And when you think, and we, when I did this thing on the Constitution, we, we went into this in some detail, what was happening at the creation of the Constitution, at the creation of our country? You had these 13 colonies, which by now had become states, with, and each of them had a Constitution, even before the Federal Constitution. But historically, though they occupied the same continent and relatively the same coastline, but that changed from north to south, you've got all kinds of divisions, slave versus free, ag agrarian versus developing urban structure and manufacture and so on. And historically, their ties were almost as close to Britain as colonies of Britain, separate colonies, as they were to each other. And yet they have sort of come together to fight the revolution and they were a sort of in and out process. It took them, what was it, I think seven years to finally ratify the Articles of Confederation, which was the first of our constitutions. Every state had to ratify it and it just took that long to get ratification. So they're sort of functioning without a constitution uh, and fighting this war and they emerged victorious essentially outlasting the British. The British could have kept fighting, uh, but they finally decided it wasn't worth it. And now they're coming together to form some sort of nation under some sort of constitution. And to me, it's a miraculous event, the Constitutional Convention, three or four months, 55 people at a big committee meeting. And they come out with this thing called the Constitution that we've lived with since. But it's a constitution that is federal, which is to say there is a national government, but these states were not going to sacrifice everything to the national government, for sure. They were going to protect their rights as states. So, and then, you know, we just fought a revolution against tyranny, and uh, so how, how strong a government do we want? Uh, the very fact that Washington existed allowed them to decide, yeah, let's have an executive. They had no executive under the Articles. Federation. They, did, they mistrusted executives, kings. They built in an impeachment process so you can get rid of the king. He tries to, tries to be a king, etc. Uh, so they're trying to build safeguard, balance of power, one part of the government, balance against it. We're seeing that right now. Congress is fighting the president. Which, I mean, the, the, actually the framers intended Congress to be more, much more powerful than the presidency. That isn't the way it's evolved. But that was certainly their intention. You've got the courts there, sort of arbitrating between the two. Uh, it, it's, it's a strange kind of 
Constitution in a way because they're trying to meld these independent states into some sort of common nation and how, that can go forward with commonality. Now Washington comes in and his emphasis is on the nation. He's a Virginian, but he's trying to convince Virginians to be more interested in this nation than in Virginia. Virginia is the most powerful of the states coming in under the Constitution. So he, his group begins to be known as Federalists. Look, wanting a strong, energetic government, as they call it, an energetic federal government. But there are a lot of people who are really suspicious of this. I mean, after all, the spirit of 76 was vibrant individualism, vibrant states, or colonies. Uh, and so we want, a lot of people want to protect the rights of the states and the rights of individuals. There was no Bill of Rights in the Constitution, but the Constitution would never have been passed if Madison and others had not promised, yeah, we'll, we'll put one in there after we get going, which they did. The first ten amendments of the Constitution were very early on in the national period to protect our individual rights. So you've got other groups who are more focused on individual rights and states' rights, and they get to be known as Republicans. So the first two parties, and we're still, we're still fighting about this, it's still central to our politics. How much national power should there be? How much individual protection should there be? How much states' rights should there be? It's, it's a complicated <coughs> system, and we've never really resolved that, and we probably never will. So those are the first two parties. The Federalists overplay their hand in a number of ways. There are only two Federalist papers, uh, President, Washington and John Adams. And Adams had a lot of difficulties. Washington did also in his, in his second term. And so Adams is replaced by the founder of this Republican idea and party, Thomas Jefferson. So Jefferson is the one you want to associate with this individual rights, states' rights. Uh, at one point, uh, an Alien and Sedition Act con controversy, uh, Jefferson's arguing that Virginia and, and Kentucky should be able to secede from the Union. He's making the secession argument, they could, because this national government's passed these awful laws that are arbitrarily imprisoning people, trampling on people's rights, and so on. So if you don't like what the federal government's done, we should, you should be able to secede from the federal government. So you've got the issue of secession early on. And that's the sort of Republican principle. And there are going to be a series of Republican presidents, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. All Virginians. All slaveholders. All slaveholders, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll get into slavery with, with Clay, too. All right, so in the process that the, the Federalists have become most more or less a New England party. They're, they're way too regional. And then the, the War of 1812 comes along under Madison, and the Federalists are almost seditious with respect to the War of 1812. They really are against it. And they sort of work against it, and they kill themselves in the process. The Federalist Party does not survive its opposition to the War of 1812. So after 1814 and the settlement of that war, it's virtually a non-factor. I suppose the most important factor left of the Federalist Party is that, um, um, why, why am I having this? Having this the senior moment right in front of me, folks. <laughs> um, Oh, anyway, I'll, I'll come back to it <laughs> in terms of, of some federal influence. Okay, the next president, uh, elected in 1825, is John Quincy Adams. Now, he's John Adams' son, so he comes from a Federalist background, but he's, the Federalists are dead. So he sort of is elected under the sort of National Republican banner, and you're going to have now a split within the Republican Party. That's what happens when a party is dominant. Uh, then they develop splits within the party, and Republicans develop that split. And you're going to have the more democratic Republicans who are Jackson's folks, a populist kind of movement. Whereas the more established Republicans are calling themselves national Republicans. So there, there's, it's not a formal split, but it's a, it's a de facto split that comes in the party. We're going to talk quite a bit about the election of, eight, of uh, 
1824 when we get. Uh, when I get into get into clay. So anyway, <clears throat> Jackson's going to be elected in 1829 after after that until 1837. Served two terms. What happens? The National Republicans now are so adamantly opposed to Jackson that they disappear, and a Whig party is created in order to oppose Andrew Jackson. Uh, taking from the English tradition of the Whigs opposing the Crown why they, they adopt that name. So it's, it's actually Clay, Calhoun, John Calhoun from South Carolina, and Daniel Webster from Maine, who create this new Whig party in opposition to Andrew Jackson. So they're, you know, it, you now have, once again, two identifiable parties having political conventions. The whole character of politics changes this time. It, it's been more or less a matter of of manipulation of the Electoral College up to this time. Now the Electoral College is going to be much more responsive to lar increasingly large numbers of people who are actually voting in presidential elections from this time on. All right, so you've got the Whigs and the, and the, and the those Jacksonian Republicans now call themselves Democrats. So the Democratic Party is now going to have an uninterrupted history right up to now. It changes a lot in, the, in that history, but it's still the same party. That's why you used to have this Jefferson Jackson Bay dinner, but since both were slaveholders, uh, we no longer call it the Jefferson Jackson, the Democrats no longer call it, we, I, I have to say that, yeah, no longer call it the uh, Jefferson Jackson Bay dinner. But that, that Jacksonian party now is going to have a straight line connection from right up into the present time. But the Whigs are going to disappear. Because in the mid-1850s, the issue of slavery is so prominent, and the Whigs have been a South and North party, and there are lots of Whigs who are slaveholders, including Clay. And so the Whig party essentially, over the issue of slavery, disappears, and it's replaced by a thing called the Republican Party. So you now have that name resurrected, but as an entirely new party, <clears throat> which is started as a Whig party. But they sort of leave their southern roots behind them and uh, become a new party. And now, you, now you're going to have Republicans and Democrats. Guess what? We still do. But those two parties, but just, just a word about that, not to get too deeply into contemporary politics, but those two parties transform. The Democrats are identified with slavery, uh, they identified with a pretty strong federal government. Uh, they're heavily, heavily represented in the South. They're Southern, more in terms of regionalism, they're a Southern party. What are they today? Almost no presence in the South. Uh, not a party that ever wants to claim identification with slavery. Democrats are busy, busy, busy trying to forget about that particular part of that democratic heritage. Two things happen. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is elected as a democratic president, for, and he serves three plus terms, and he has a very different orientation. Uh, so that's a transformation. And then comes mid-1960s, 1965, 64, Civil Rights Act, 65, the Voting Rights Act. And as Lyndon Johnson said at the time, we just lost the South for a generation. They lost it for more than a generation. Uh, the Democrats become the supporters of civil rights and of integration in our society, and et cetera. And that means their strength has been in the South. It's a Southern president who leads this, that is to say, Lyndon Johnson from Texas, uh, who, you know, Mer he was a miracle worker in order to get these two things passed and to get some Democratic support for it, mostly Republican support for it. But it, it, it switched things around, and now the Republicans uh, see a wonderful opportunity. The Democrats have lost the South, it's moving to the South, and then the, then the views of the South, etc., are going to be very important to the party. So, anyway, there's the quick overview of, of how we uh, develop this, these parties have developed. Let's go back to the real thread of what we're doing here. As to say, getting to the 1844 election, Henry Clay um, promulgated a thing called the American system. 
And this is Clay's sort of basic idea. One of the reasons that you, you can associate with Lincoln and Clay so closely is, is because of the way that this developed with, under Clay, the American system. Above all, Clay is working for union. He sees, you know, this art, this fragile structure. We, we, we do have a fragile structure under our Constitution by the way it was made and the way it's sort of unfolded. And there's always the danger that this will break apart. We're going to fight a, you know, this huge civil war in the 1860s. <laughs> well, are we going to break apart into two nations or are we going to hold together as one nation? Uh, in order to hold together as one nation, one part of the nation had to be subdued, defeated, and held by force. And that's how, how fragile this, this constitutional structure is. Clay was utterly devoted to the Union and utterly devoted to having policies that will strengthen that Union. So you start with that with Clay. Internal improvements are really important to make, make in the Union. Uh, this, he, st he starts out his political career before railways are there uh, when the best hopes are for good roads and canals, water, water transportation, dr dredge rivers, dredge, dredge harbors, and so on. So he's constantly pushing for these internal improvements. And the way that he wants to pay for it is there's, all, there's still a lot of territory out there, it's still, still federal lands, and then use the, fund, the proceeds from selling those federal lands, either federally to develop transportation systems or to give that money to states to, to allow many. He starts out sort of federally doing that and then realizes that the only way we can get this done is we give the money to the states. The states want to, want to be in control of developing these improvements. And if you can improve and improve communication and connectivity, then you can keep the union together. Uh, and so this becomes a, a, a real mantra for the big. And Clay is concerned, and this gets us into the real conflict that's going to happen after 1844. We should expand too rapidly because then we move beyond our infrastructure. Let's develop the infrastructure first and then think about expansion rather than make all that expansion out there and, and sort of then all the expense of that expansion and trying to keep it together and so on without, without the infrastructure. So he, 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 he is an anti-expansionist uh, sort of person. <clears throat> I, I don't think I need to say much more about it. I mean, these sort of get the highlights of, of his policy. Now, interestingly enough, just to make this connection with Lincoln, Lincoln married a woman named Mary Todd. Do you remember where her hometown is? Lexington, Kentucky. She knew Henry Clay from birth. I mean, the Clay family and the Todd family were very, they were Whigs. Uh, Todd's were a strong Whig family. And, and so Mary Todd helps to make that connect, connection for Lincoln with Clay, because she virtually all her life uh, knew Clay. Uh, Lincoln campaigned heavily for Clay, and all, the many times he ran for president. And then think about what Lincoln's government does. When the Civil War starts, they lose the Southern representatives in Congress who were born with the Confederacy. Now, the Republicans can, can carry out the Whig program, because the, these uh, Democrats from the South have opposed it. So what happens in 1862? National Railroad Act. We're going to create a transcontinental railway. Uh, the Homestead Act. People can, with a small investment, can go out and homestead in the territories, in the open lands, and the uh, federal government will sponsor establishing people on the land. The Land Grant College Act, using the sale of lands, with policy, to develop colleges and universities that will focus on engineering and agriculture. All in 1862, uh, done by Lincoln and the Republicans. So there, there, I mean, this sort of establishes this close identity, uh, infrastructure development, improvements, that are happening under, under the Lincoln administration. Clay, for all of his activities, in, in, night, in the late 1950s, a commission was created, and Ken, John F. Kennedy chaired it as a senator, and they did a study of the 
most effective uh, members of the Senate over time. And Clay is one of the five that are listed. Interestingly, three of the five were all associates uh, with Clay. Well, he won them, not Leslie. John C. Calhoun, Daniel Webster, and the other are two more. Robert LaFalla and Robert Peck were the five that they indicated as the most effective members historically in the Senate. <coughs> All right. Well, just a little more about Clay and the things that he actually accomplished. I've talked a little bit about his policies. Now, what did he, what did he actually accomplish? In 1811, he had quite a career in the House before he had in the Senate. It's kind of interesting when you read his biography, and by the way, I've got on the, on the back of this handout, a, a, you know, suggestions about things you, if, if you get interested in either of these people. Um, he had got to get elected, essentially elected by the people for the House, right? How were senators uh, elected back then? <laughs> State legislature appointed them. So, um, sometimes he's in the House, sometimes the Senate goes back to the House. Uh, so it's a kind of mixed career at first. He ultimately ends up uh, in the Senate. Virtually any time he wanted to be in the Senate, he could. He had enough political power in, in Kentucky that uh, if he said, I really want to be in the Senate now, uh, he, when the next time an election came around, he'd be in the Senate. So it's kind of an interesting uh, dynamic that happens there. Well, in 1811, he was the youngest person and the first person ever elected in his first term, Speaker of the House. So he's just elected to the House of Representatives. He'd come out of being out in the uh, Kentucky legislature, and he's elected to, the, to be Speaker. And he transforms the House. The House was a pretty, I mean, they didn't have very good rules. You know, one, one person was uh, constantly being harangued, harangued because he carried, had his dog there all. Time, and the dog was making messes and barking and so on, and, and uh, he, wanted, he, he, he was a kind of a character, he said, I've got to have my dog. It wasn't a service dog, I don't think. Uh, it certainly wasn't trained as a service dog. And so Clay is generally credited with having really launched the movement for pretty stringent house rules. Uh, he, he appointed a very strong rules committee and they structured the House of Representatives much more effectively. So that's a, that's a real contribution. And then he's picked, along with John Quincy Adams and Albert Gallatin, who was the Secretary of the Treasury, to negotiate the Treaty of Ghent, uh, which ended the War of 1812. So again, as a pretty young man, he's, he's involved with, with uh, international peace negotiation. He and, he and Adams have an interesting relationship. Adams was very upright, very moral, very straight, and there's Clay, you know, going off and doing all this stuff during the negotiations, going out drinking, going over and playing cards and so on, maybe seeing women, uh, and they didn't like, I mean, this didn't go well with Adams at all. So they're, 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 when they first worked together, it didn't go well, but he's eventually going to be Adams' Secretary of State uh, after Adams wins the election in 1824. <coughs> He's, the, he's essentially the architect of the Missouri Compromise, 1828, the negotiations 1819, 1820. Again, I mean, this, it, 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 in a way it's easy to understand, in a way it isn't. We're so focused on the Civil War and slavery that the issue of slavery, it just bedevils American life and politics throughout the, the early part of the 19th century. It's just always, always there. Here's Missouri, where slaveholders are already wanting to be cut, move from a territory to be a state, is ready to be a state. But that's going to unbalance within the Senate slave states versus free states. There'll be more slave states, and they're going to get two senators, so there'll be more slave senators than there'll be, be free state senators. Ah, Maine is ready to come in. So they the compromise said Maine and, and Missouri could come in without any restrictions on slavery. Okay, you may get slavery in Missouri, you're certainly not going to get it in Maine. So it'll keep the balance. And then they draw this, this parallel line, 36 degrees, 30, 30 minute line, which is essentially to, to, to put it in your mind, the southern Kansas border, northern Oklahoma border. That's it. Now Missouri is north of that border, most of it. 
uh, they can be they can be swayed. But no other state. Uh, that's going to be the, the indicator as we as these uh, you know we've developed states moving west and into the uh, Louisiana Purchase. Why uh, the ones north will be free, the ones south will be slaves. So that's the uh, I mean here's here's Clay wanted to keep the union together. We're going to divide over slavery at some point if we don't work really work hard on this. So he's the, he has this ability. Okay, we've got we've got to stop in a few minutes. Um, so. If, if we can keep this thing balanced, then we may be able to live together. If it gets imbalanced, we may not live together. And also, in this period, from it's really the eight, by this time, you've got this evangelical movement, powerful religious forces, which many of them are identified with abolition, certainly in the North. So that religion is going to really fuel abolitionist ideas, activity, and so on. And that, that, that they're even getting to the point where they have gag rules in the Senate that uh, you, if, you, if you get an abolitionist petition, you'll just never hear it. There's the right in the Constitution to petition Congress, but they're in the, in the Senate creating gag rules, so we don't want to hear this. So you can't, if you, this is the kind of petition that comes forward, we're not going to bring it to the floor. You can, we'll accept it, it'll come in, come in here, but we'll never talk about it. So it's, it really is bedeviling politics. And, Clay says we've got we've got to do something to keep this union together. So that's that's the compromise of 1820, Missouri Compromise. 1833. I think I can get through these these, these things, and then we'll break. 1833, the so nullification crisis over South Carolina comes to the to a head between Jackson and and Calhoun. Jackson and Calhoun hated each other, and that's that's part of it. But Jackson, the, the Whigs believe in, and, and, and the, the group that Clay represents, believe in high tariffs. Tariffs are, within the Constitution, initially, the primary source of federal funding. There weren't going to be taxes, income taxes, and so on. We were supposed to run the government out of tariffs. So there's a good reason to have high tariffs in order to fund the government, but also it protects you know, these fragile New England and East Coast industries trying to compete with the British, so we want to protect our industry. Hurts the South because they're agrarian, and they want these goods to be as cheap as possible, the, the manufactured goods they have to buy. So the Southerners don't like it. And so over tariffs, <coughs> South Carolina threats to secede from the United States to nullify the tariff. They won't, they won't enforce the tariff. Huge conflict, and Jackson, who tends to believe in lower tariffs, but yes, it's South Carolina and Jackson and, and Calhoun who want it. That he's not going to go with it. He was ready to invade South Carolina in order to keep the I mean a little civil war. I mean the North invading South Carolina uh, to keep them from leaving. So who comes forward? Henry Clay comes forward to negotiate a peaceful arrangement between Calhoun, South Carolina, and. Jackson, where they lower some tariffs that are badly needed on products badly needed in the South and keep them high on virtually everything else. So, uh, he, again, he accepts and resolved that. Just, now, I'll go into this in greater detail later, but the other thing he's credited with is the Compromise of 1850. Uh, again, uh, pre Civil War effort to keep the Union together. California is ready to come into the Union, etc. So it's, it's new states coming into the Union, and I'll, I'll explain that later in, in our uh, talk, and I think we need to stop. So enjoy your coffee and cookies. Uh, we'll take a ten-minute break, and if you lose track of time, you come back. <laughs> I was Christmas shopping at the Christmas, uh, bookstore. George. Thank you, Dan. Still okay with the sound? <coughs> okay. Well, I'm, I'm going to get into uh, uh, play a little bit more about play, and then we'll get to 1844. But I want to start with 18, the 1824 election and the corrupt bargain. Uh, in the election of 1824, play was running. So was John Quincy Adams. So was Andrew Jackson. So was a man named Crawford, who was who was a Secretary of War. In the popular vote, Jackson got 153,000 votes, 99 electoral votes. 
Adams got 114,000 votes, 84 electoral votes. Clay had 47,000 votes, 37 electoral votes. Crawford about 47,000, and they converted to 41 electoral votes. So nobody has won a majority of the electoral college. And when that happens, it reverts to the House of Representatives to decide who will be president. Clearly, Jackson is way ahead. I mean, significantly ahead. But Clay and Adams have a three-hour meeting, at the end of which all of Clay's electoral votes go to Adams. Adams wins the election. The corrupt bargain. This is Hillary Clinton's emails on steroids as, far as, as, a, as a charge against the, can, against the person. It never leaves uh, Clay. It probably has as much to do with anything, the fact that he ever won the presidency. It, this is, I mean, Jackson, can you imagine Jackson? I mean, I totally understand. He's incensed. He should be president of the United States. He clearly was the, the major, I mean, had, had come out ahead. Not enough ahead to actually win the election, but enough ahead that he should, in the House, <laughs> be granted the presidency. But it goes to goes to Adams, and guess what? Henry Clay becomes Secretary of State, which is the best springboard in those days, and to some degree still is a pretty good springboard into being considered president. So it's very much to his advantage to be uh, Adams Secretary of State. He later said, later regretted it. He, after he you know, lived with it for so many years that it was a bad mistake for him to have done that. Maybe to have shifted his votes to Adams, because he certainly preferred Adams over, over Jackson, but then to accept a reward for that shift, namely being Secretary of State, never left him. And so he, he's, he's got this stain of the, correct, of the corrupt bargain that's going to stick with him virtually forever. And then other things that he had reason for Jackson to hate him, I mean, hate is not too strong a word. In 1819, Jackson, still a military man, with semi-authorization from President James Monroe, invades Florida and defeats the Spanish in Florida, and Florida becomes part of the United States. It was a, uh, from, from the point of view of most people's understanding, kind of a wildcat operation. Probably Monroe approved it, but not officially so. One of these things where you look the other way. And Clay attacked the, that Florida invasion, aggression, in, in the Senate. Uh, so he really attacked, that's his first major attack on, on Jackson. Then you may have heard in the current circumstances of impeachment that some people are recommending that what the Democrats to do is to censure the president. There's only one historical moment when a president has been censured. It was a censure sponsored by Henry Clay against Andrew Jackson in, in uh, 1837. Jackson, as you probably know, was very much against the National Bank. It was the national, second national bank. And he was maneuvering to get it to uh, not be renewed. He's going to veto any renewal. But before that happened, he withdrew all the funds from the bank and distributed them to state banks. And Clay sponsored a censure motion against Andrew Jackson, which passed in the Senate. Not in the House, but in the Senate. Later, when the Democrats were back in power, they expunged that from the record. But uh, anyway, that's the one historical president which has been cited lately, I've heard it cited at least once or twice in the news, that maybe that's what the Democrats should be doing. Once again, Clay against Jackson. So it was, you know, that, that clash and that enmity was huge. In, the 18, in 1839, Clay no longer felt he had to deal with the issue of slavery because abolition is really heating up. And there's a lot of pressure on him. What, what is your position? You own slaves, but what is your position? So he gives a famous speech in the Senate about slavery. 
And what he says is, it was wrong to have introduced slaves in the United States in the first place. Slavery is wrong. But we have it now. We've got to make the best of it. And uh, we ought to get some sort of program, and he actually developed a program for gradual uh, emancipation of slaves. Would be paid for by the federal government and so on. Well, he thought he was trying to damp down this issue. He just raised it up again. The South distrusted him because he said, really, you shouldn't have slavery. The North, the abolitionists distrusted him because he said, we've got it, what can we do about it? Maybe a little bit of uh, slow abolition. So both sides, he alienates both sides with his speech. So that's another you know, stain on, on Clay that's going to you know, linger over him. So we get quickly an election in 1840, then we'll go to 1844. The Jackson is succeeded by his vice president, Martin Van Buren. So it's a Democratic presidency, and poor Van Buren is the victim of a huge depression uh, toward the end of his term. And so it's pretty clear that in the election of 1840, a Whig, the Whigs are finally going to win that, this new Whig party. And the obvious Whig candidate is Henry Clay. But there are certain forces in the party who don't want Clay, for a variety of reasons. For the abolitionist forces certainly don't want him. Um, the corrupt bargain hang, hangs over him. And then Clay is um, a loose cannon to some degree. You can't control him. And the political bosses, Thurlow Weed in, in New York, uh, William Seward, who becomes Lincoln's Secretary of State, adamantly oppose Clay's nomination. So they maneuver in the convention to get control of the Rules Committee, and they change the rules into each state has one vote. Well, that cooks Clay's goose. Uh, if, if, in a, if, if the delegates could each make, place their own vote, he had a pretty good chance, but under those circumstances, no. So they nominate William Henry Harrison uh, as the president. Clay loses the nomination. And then they, the think is this will help us, we'll, we'll really seal this election, we'll have a Democratic Vice President, John Tyler. Well, uh, unfortunately, William Henry Harrison, on a very cold and I think rainy day, decides to make a very long inaugural address without a coat on. He catches cold, pneumonia, what, dies within a month of being inaugurated. And guess who? John Tyler, another Democrat, is now the President of the United States. It's it, interestingly, from a constitutional point of view, it's the first time a Vice President has inherited the Presidency, and they, it was a real issue. Is he sort of the substitute President, or is he the President? Uh, they had not resolved that, and it finally, it, it, in fact, Tyler comes in and says, I'm the President, and people pretty much accept that. But that, that's the first time it's been tested. Does the Vice, vice President inherit the actual Presidency, or is he a substitute for the President? Not, not leading legitimately the president. All right, now we're going to get to the election of 1844, and I'm glad to be here with some time left. Uh, as you, any of you who heard me lecture before know that I have some some, some problem controlling my time. My time. Um, Clay does win the nomination for presidency in 1844. And he's opposed by a relative, on, on a national scale, relatively unknown, James K. Polk, who ha has been, is the um, speak, Speaker of the House of Representatives. So he's a very prominent politician, definitely a Jacksonian. And um, he's sort of a he dark horse candidate. Everybody, everybody knows Clay. He's been around forever. Uh, you have an opinion about Clay, corrupt bargain, Slavery, uh, the Union, the, the American system, all these positives and negatives floating around. Uh, but he's extremely, extremely well known. And Clay's platform is that we will restore the Bank of the United States, that is to say the National Bank, will create, as a result of that, a uniform currency. They're going to have to wait 
because they lose that election. They're going to have to wait until the Civil War to finally get a uniform currency in the United States. And imagine uh, an ex the economics and, and the social relations and economic relationships in a society where you've got a lot of different legal tender floating around, which we have. And one of the things that a national bank could do would be to create a single currency. So that's big in its platform. Selective tariffs to protect American industry. Sell federal lands and distribute proceeds to states for improvements. Do not annex Texas. Oh, wait, right, let's stop it. Man. Here's Texas. The Lone Star State. Still the Lone Star State in many ways. I mean, Texas is a is huge. It's a, it, it, it plays a huge role in American society. In the 1830s, as a result of a lot of American white immigration into that part of Mexico, they fight a war in the mid-1830s against Mexico and win their independence. So from the mid-1830s on now, in a very tenuous uh, situation, vulnerable situation, Texas is a separate state. And the question, and it, it's mostly populated, or at least significantly populated, by white Americans. So they're pushing for joining the United States, being annexed into the United States. Tyler was all for it. And so he begins the process in the Congress, and Clay frustrates it, stops it. He's against the annexation of Texas. Again, acquiring new land. We let's, let's develop the land that we've already got, rather than push it out. So he's at, at definite, I mean, when, you, when you're opposed to the annexation of Texas at that point, that's an easy game. That's a really easy game. The Texans want the protection of being part of the United States. And he's saying no. I mean, that is really opposition to expansion of a high sort, because that was an easy, easy picking. So he's against the annexation of Texas. And he also says pres the presidency should be limited to one term. Polk also has the same thing on his platform. So you've got two people running who say that will they'll only serve one term. Polk, the dark horse candidate, speaker of the house, and Polk being Polk, uh, it was a not a, a platform that did not by any means reveal all of his intentions. The the big issue at this point with respect to territory besides Texas was Oregon. And, and I, now I ref, let's look at a, let, let, let's look at one of these maps. The one uh, in, in the second sheet of maps, uh, restoration of, of the Oregon question, 1846. You probably have heard the expression 5440 or fight. Have you heard that? Well, this was what the Democrats wanted. They wanted all of the Oregon territories disputed between England and the U.S. Uh, Clear, there have been a lot of Americans who have immigrated into the southern part of that area. The disputed triangle, the enclave and so on you see there, has got a fair amount, particularly in the Willamette Valley, a fair amount of American immigration. So the Americans are establishing a foothold in terms of population in the southern part of the Oregon of area. And as, as you're moving into this election, 1844, there's almost no mention of Mexico except in relation to Texas but no hint of a war against Mexico. But we'll fight for Oregon. That's what the Democrats are saying in their platform. We're going to fight for Oregon, uh, all of Oregon, 5440, which we, you know, essentially be British Columbia uh, in, in, on today's map. We want a, we want a British Columbia. And that's in the, in the Democratic platform. So that's what the Democrats are focused on. While at the same time, once once elected, Polk is negotiating in a very compromising way with the British, saying, well, let's go down to 49 degrees across, and there was a disputed triangle, that was what it was really questioned, was the British going to get that or not. Finally, the British said, well, we want all of Vancouver Island. So that goes below 49th parallel. But otherwise, we'll settle for the 49th parallel. So Polk, against his own platform, is negotiating with the British being very amicable with, with the British. And he succeeds, we'll, we'll get, uh, but uh, I, everyone's eyes are on Oregon, and Polk comes into office determined 
to get Mexican territory. And not to negotiate for it, but to grab it. That's, that, that's, his, that's his policy. But what is, after in particular is California, that we, we should have a Pacific Coast, and San Francisco Bay is, you know, the greatest harbor you could possibly want. When, when all said and done, when they actually are negotiated with the Mexicans, the Whigs say, let's take San Francisco only. Only San Francisco. Give, it, give the rest back, back to, to the Mexicans. So they're, they're, they're really on the other side of, other side of it. Polk, once he comes into office, he's working. Could we buy Mexico? I mean, uh, California, excuse me. Could we buy California? Or could we foment an internal rebellion in California? Or do we have to go to war with the Mexicans to get it? That's sort of the alternatives. At the meantime, he's negotiating with the British to settle Oregon. He gets it settled. The actual, actually, the Oregon settlement comes in May of 1846. The war with Mexico starts in late April. And, you know, people are pretty surprised about what's, what's going on. How does, how does Polk going get, uh, to get, get Mexico? What he does, and again, let, let's look at another map uh, that, that would be helpful here. And this is the map on the back of the one on of Oregon, you know, on the back of the Oregon map, the one on the Mexican War. Um, between, as, 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 you know, you see, Texas is kind of an unusual looking thing. It would, goes way up into what would be New Mexico uh, today, and, and it's sort of a funny, funny territory. The old, only, the southern part of Texas is the part that's, that's really contested at this point. The, the Rio Grande River, as we all know, is the border between Mexico and the United States, in, in Texas. There's a, another river a, a ways north, maybe 50, 60 miles north, the Nunches River, and that uh, was as far as the Mexicans was concerned, was the southern border of Texas. So anything that happens between the Nunches River and the Rio Grande is regarded by the Mexicans as an invasion of Mexico. What does Polk do? He sends Zachary Taylor down to the Rio Grande, build, who builds a fort and points artillery at Mexico. On, as far as Mexico is concerned, Mexican territory. And this is what provokes the Mexicans to attack Zachary Taylor in April of 1846 and start the Mexican War. So, uh, again, a very nifty maneuver. Mexicans start the war, technically, though we have already invaded Mexican territory as far as the Mexicans are concerned. So, that, 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 that's, uh, I mean, Polk is really very clever, and not only clever, but he manages to accomplish these things. Now, um, let me, I think what's, what I want to do at this point is to just talk about the in impact of the Mexican War and then we'll say just a little bit about the war. As a, re as a result of the Pope presidency, Texas is annexed to the United States of America, Oregon is settled, adding quite a bit of settled territory to the United States. And then as a result of the Mexican War, we acquire the current states of California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, parts of New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. It, is, it doesn't quite double the size of the United States, but it is the largest single acquisition. It's bigger than the, than the Louisiana Purchase. I mean, it is huge. Now, you could, anyone in this room would have to argue, yeah, but sometime we probably would have tried to get that territory, whether it was under Polk or whether it was under a subsequent president. Probably we would have felt that our manifest destiny, and manifest destiny is the term associated with Polk. It is our manifest destiny. He didn't actually say it. The, the, the newspapers describing Polk's policy coined the term manifest destiny. It is our manifest destiny to move all the way to the Pacific within the north-south confines of what we think of as the United States of America. And he accomplishes it. But what is the result? It, now that line 
that you draw off the Missouri Compromise goes all the way to the West Coast. Now, it doesn't just include the, the Louisiana Purchase Territories, it goes all the way to the West Coast. Are we really going to settle for that as the line between slavery and free? I mean, Texas has, has got slavery. We've had it. So it looks as though, particularly the southern part of this area, has looks very promising. It just unsettles the, the notion of the uh, Missouri Compromise. So they make a compromise in 1850 because California is populous enough that it, it's ready to be a, ready to be a state, right? After, I mean, shortly after the Mexican War. War Mexican War, 1846 to 48. Two years later, they've got California, you know, uh, petitioning to become a state. Once again, Henry Clay, the loser in 1844, steps forward with a compromise. And the, the compromise of 1850, and let me get, get to my proper note. Well, I, I think I can virtually... Um, in indicate what that compromise involved. California will be admitted as a free state. It sort of balances the already admission of Texas as a, as a slave state. Um, and sl slavery will, will be abolished in the District of Columbia. So another, another gain for the abolitionists. But we will, they passed the Fugitive Slave Law. A very very stringent fugitive slave law, and that the southern people are most interested in that at that point because the abolitionists and the, and the underground railroad and so on are really beginning to drain off their slaves. So if they can get a really strong fugitive late slave law, so those folks on the underground railway could be prosecuted, uh, and so that becomes U.S. law. It's a huge step in in the effort to prevent the escape of, of slaves and make northerners responsible. Uh, to the law for what, what they're doing in that effort. So, once again, Clay steps forward for a temporary resolution. But that temporary resolution still is not satisfactory. You still got issue of all this territory that sometimes can become states and so on. So, in 1854, they pass the Nebraska-Kansas Act, 1854, which sort of, it says, it's a free-for-all. Uh, it's up to who settles in these states, and if we're a democracy, let the people in those territories and states vote for them want to be slave or free. What it does, then, is unleash this tremendous... I mean, we're part, we're part of that uh, in, in, in way in, in Iowa, in Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska, and so on. Are these areas going to be settled by free folks or by slave folks? So there's a, con there's a contest, and Kansas becomes bloody Kansas, which Gene and I talk about quite a bit. He, he knows more about it than I do. But you get, you know, virtual civil war in Kansas between slave forces and free forces. So it, it just so unsettles things that this is what brings Abraham Lincoln, who, by the way, was elected in Congress in 1844, was made speeches against the Mexican War, was adamantly opposed to the Mexican War, and uh, it's what brings him, he has only one term in Congress, decides not to, not to run again, uh, goes back to his law practice, but 1854 brings him out. It also creates a new party called the Republican Party. And the Whigs are really going to be cast aside, and it's going to be the Republicans, and Lincoln's gonna, not going to be their first standard bearer in 1856, that was Fremont. But in 1860, he'll be the standard bearer for, for the Republicans. He's back in politics in a big, big way. You get the Lincoln-Douglas debates in 1858, uh, House divided speech virtually after the after the uh, Kansas-Nebraska Act issue. And, you know, we cannot we cannot stand half slave and half free in this nation. We've got to, we've got to settle this. Uh, no wonder the South was worried about him being. You know, he, seven states seceded before he was even inaugurated. They knew what they saw him as, you know, the black Republican is going to take slavery away from us and change the whole nature of things. So, what I'm arguing here, and some historians, I mean, this is by no means the, uh, the common feeling of historians, but it's a feeling of some historians, that if we had not acquired all that land in the Mexican War, we would not have had a civil war. 
So, I mean, and, and it might have come later, but it was, it was that, the contest over that territory, the worry about what's going to happen to the territory, that precipitates the issues that bring, bring to head with Kansas, Nebraska Act, and, uh, you know, the rest of the things that actually lead to civil war. The creation of the Republican Party, Abraham Lincoln coming back into the center of things, and so on, as a devotee of Clay. So that, that's why I'm uh, indicating that I think this 1844 election was one of the more momentous elections in Amer American history. The, I mean, just the acquisition of all that land. Clay would not have done that. There's no question about it. Clay would not have done that. He might have settled Oregon because that's the kind of thing that negotiation can do. Uh, he would not have. He would not have uh, annexed Texas. The next Texas. We would not have had the Mexican War. Um, it's what a boy have said, you know, we're into a whole, whole uncharted territory there. It's hard to imagine that we wouldn't have, at some point, tried to push forward to the Pacific Coast. Yeah. Especially with the vulnerability of Mexico. I mean, in, in the Mexican War, they had the larger army, but they were virtually bankrupt as a country. Eighty percent of their budget went to debt, debt maintenance, paying off the, the interest on their debt. I mean, they were in bad shape. Uh, we happened to have uh, a pretty, wasn't a large army, wasn't as large as, as the Texas Army, but it was certainly a very uh, good and talented army. Some, some people have argued that Scott's, with, with his, we've got a map here, uh, Winfield Scott, the war was at the two big generals, there's Zachary Taylor, fighting in the north, in the north of the Mexican War, so again, looking at that Mexican War map, and Winfield Scott, who sort of, re Scott recreates Cortez' conquest of the Me Mexico, lands at Veracruz, and they move right across half of Mexico and take Mexico City. One of the heroes of that movement was um, Robert E. Lee. He was a captain, and... Uh, he scouted out a way that the, the Mexicans had, there was a narrow area they had to go through where the Mexicans had marshaled their forces to intercept and, uh, you know, annihilate the U.S. Army when it had to go through this narrow area. Lee found another route, and they went completely around that area. And, and uh, Lee's contribution, the, the Ulysses Grant was in, in that war, uh, what West, West Point Garrett was with Lee. He was a lieutenant, not as high up as Lee was, and, and involved a lot in logistics. Longstreet in it, Meade, McClellan, Pickett. Jefferson Davis was a colonel in the Mexican War. Uh, a lot of figures that we associate with the American Civil War, and they learned their trade on the battlefield in the uh, Mexican War. And it was, as general regard, as one of the more successful operations by the U.S. Army but was very, um, uh, you know, mortality was high, mostly from disease, or more from disease than battle, but 10% of the, of the <coughs> soldiers died and 20% were casualties. Highest uh, death rate of any uh, war, war we've ever fought, but as I say, it's more disease than it was uh, the actual uh, fighting itself. The peace treaty, and then we'll, I'll stop, is very interesting. A man named Nicholas Trist, who had a pretty good reputation as a negotiator, was um, charged by Polk to negotiate the peace. He went down in 1847, obviously before the war was finished, and he had specifics that, that uh, Polk wanted. You can see in the um, lower map here what Polk wanted, which was all of the Baja Peninsula, and it goes way, way south of the Rio Grande River, down incorporating maybe what is a third of current Mexico. He was also hoping to get the Yucatan Peninsula, and also hoping to get fight, fight a war with Cuba. That he wasn't going to get that. He, Mexican didn't control Cuba, but he thought maybe they could get Cuba as well. So that I mean, uh, Tris uh, was charged with trying to get something pretty close to what Pope was, was out for in Mexico. But Trist uh, didn't fo exactly follow his orders. 
And he, for one thing, <laughs> over the southern border of Texas, he allowed the Mexicans to, to go negotiate that. Uh, Polk heard about it and ordered him home. And Trist didn't come home. He kept on negotiating. And Elganis, and, and Winfield Scott was protected. Both Scott and, and Taylor were Whigs. And Polk began to undercut them uh, pretty strongly as the war was coming to an end. Uh, and, you know, Zachary Polk, Zachary Taylor was going to run for president. Again, as John pointed out, he wasn't going to last very long as president, but he was, he's, the, he's uh, the second of the Whig uh, presidents elected. So anyway, Tress goes ahead and completes the negotiation. He was authorized to pay up to $20 million to the Mexicans. They're going to get some money for this. And he actually negotiated it down to $15 million, $15 million. So that's what the Mexicans got. And the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo was signed in 1848, sent to Polk and Congress. Polk had, well, sent Polk first. And he kind of, you know, what's he going to do? He's got a fait accompli, an actual treaty, negotiated by a guy that he had called back, you know, was, was supposed to continue the negotiation. But it was such a, such a favorable treaty that he had not much, much alternative but to send it to the Senate. And as I said, the Whigs opposed the treaty, signing the treaty in the Senate. And as I said earlier, what they said that they would settle for would be San Francisco. Uh, give, <laughs> give the rest back, take the money back, and give the rest back, back to Mexico. So, uh, Pope, as I indicated, Polk died shortly after leaving the office. Clay is going to last until 1852, last long enough uh, to negotiate compromises. And um, in 1848, guess what? He runs for president again. And he's, he's uh, not nominated. Zachary Taylor is nominated. I've sort of lost track of the number of times he tried to get the nominee. He was nominated three times, but he actually get. I think it was another two, two to three times that he was seeking the presidency. So he probably sought the presidency longer than anybody in, in American history, uh, and particularly given the fact that he didn't make it. So we've got, I, I'm going to stop, but it gives us maybe a few minutes if you have questions that you would like to raise. John? Who did Mexico owe that money to? Who did they owe the money? Well, we, we paid Mexico. No, you said Mexico was paying 80%. Oh, who, John's question is uh, uh, the Mexican debt and, and the debt service that they have. The, my, my short answer is I don't know. I, I suspect that some of it was to us, but more likely to the British. Yeah. The British, uh, one of the things that, that Polk was worried about in, in getting this negotiation over Oregon out of the way before you know, getting involved with Mexico, was that the British would come in on behalf of Mexico. And particularly since they, if they got uh, Oregon unsettled, they would really try to undercut, undercut us and come in to help Mexico. So I suspect that the bulk of it was owned to the British, but I do not know the answer to that question. We've got time for maybe one more. One more. Okay. Mm -hmm. Can't tell me that I'm so satisfied. You have, you have, you have, we, know, have no we know everything we need to know. All right. Well, it's listen. It's so that, fascinating that uh, Seward ends up, you know, buying Alaska for you know, like the Yeah. But, uh, Tommy's comment is that it's fascinating that Seward ends up being the one who negotiates the person of Alaska out of the Lincoln administration, who, with all these quick, quick background of of opposing uh, acquisition of territory. That's an interesting comment. <laughs> Thank you, George. And this is the end of our bucket season. Look for publicity about what's going to come up uh, after the first of the year. And George. Yes, let's clap. Well, I, I handed out the certificate to Bruce last week, so... <laughs> so here you go. I get my, thank you very much. We appreciate your contribution. Thanks, everybody.